What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Millionaires to Billionaires podcast show. If this is your first time tuning in, let me fill you in on what we're all about. We interview successful entrepreneurs, influential people from all over the world, and we dive a little bit deeper into their story, how they got to where they're at today, and we try to formulate the conversation so that way you guys could take some notes, whether it be mental notes or notes on paper if you're sitting down, listening, and watching it. And you can apply some of the information you get today and apply it to your business, apply it to your life, whether that be personal or business. So that way you can live a more fulfilling life and go out there and create your ideal life. So today we are joined by Jonathan Kendall, an entrepreneur that I have a bio I'm going to read off. um, Some very interesting conversations that we'll be having today and touching on some of this stuff. So Jonathan Kendall, he's he's a serial entrepreneur. He's an investor. He's a speaker, he's an author, and an avid reader. So Jonathan Kendall is on a mission to help optimize your life and your business as the founder of Virtual Worker Now and Sonic Solutions. He's helped thousands of entrepreneurs scale their business. During the pandemic, Jonathan raised over $100 million for companies like Radio Shack, Pier 1 Imports, Crush Capital, Dress Barn, Farmer's Cart, and Knowledge Society, while other entrepreneurs optimize their systems while helping other entrepreneurs optimizing their systems. Now, in addition, Jonathan spent three years at MentorBox, eventually taking up the role of CEO. So we'll definitely dive into that and working closely with VC and angel funds, uh, behemoths like Red, uh, Reed Hoffman, Dan Fleshman, and Maynard Webb that manage billions of dollars in assets. So This is going to be a good conversation. A lot of these entrepreneurs you guys probably have already heard of. And so, uh, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's quite a bio. I uh, (laughs) don't think I wrote it myself, but that's that's very nice. Hey, if it fits, that's good. Jonathan's joining us from Egypt tonight, guys. Well, I say tonight because it's tonight his time. It is the morning over here in the U.S. How is uh, Egypt cheating you right now? Are you out there for work? Yeah, Virtual Worker Now has an office in Egypt. We hire a lot from the Middle East, um, Egypt and Lebanon, really all over the world, but this is one of our hubs. Um, so I was in San Francisco, obviously during the mentor box days. And then when we were raising money, we we're actually in Puerto Rico for a while. And now I'm in Egypt. I like to follow around the opportunity wherever it, wherever it takes me. That's the beauty of entrepreneurship right there. So diving in before... Uh... I I was watching a a reel you had posted. I don't know how far back you posted it, but it actually led, you were doing some copywriting, some emails and stuff for, I believe it was the LA team you went and joined and you got the phone call to go to California full time. Um, Could you tell us, give us a little brief background, how you got led up to that point and ended up moving full time out to California to to pursue that um, position? Yeah, I always say, I stole this from Naval Ravikant, but he says you have to hire for uh, IQ, basically intelligence, uh, integrity, but also ambition. And so he says you can't teach ambition. And ever since I was young, I was super ambitious. Mm -hmm. So I've always wanted to do something big. And after college, I did a bit of entrepreneurial route. But then eventually I said, no, I want to be the, I want to be a novelist. I was kind of an artist and I was going to push that. I was a writer. And then that moved into copywriting because I realized you could make more money with copywriting. And that eventually I would get bigger and bigger and bigger clients. And one of the clients was a startup in San Francisco and they hired me to make the first mentor box. So, you know, think and grow rich, how to, how to win friends and influence people, I think was the first box classics. They said, Hey, we need a workbook. We need a summary. You know, we need these scripts. And so I did that. And then very quickly, I said, hey, listen, like, I think you also need some email sequences. We should probably do a facelift on the funnel. We should probably do a new VSL, you know, because I just was trying to get some more work from them. And I also wanted to help. And they said, listen, love all of it. In fact, why don't you just come up here? And I think it was like three days before Christmas. And Alex Mayer was the co-founder of that company who I was speaking with, who sold Zeusk, which is a big dating app for $200 million, like really high level entrepreneur. And I, he pitched me, he said, listen, like, I'm going to change your life. Like there's another level to this game and it's in Silicon Valley. It's in San Francisco. And obviously you guys got to, you have, you have the goods, but 
you know, you got to be in person. And so we, me and my wife, I think probably within a week, we packed everything up and drove to San Francisco and found a place real quick. And then, you know, six years later, my, I can't, I cannot emphasize how important like having a proper mentor is because you just skip steps so quickly. Oh, so, so much Uh, speaking on that and everything. What do you think some lessons in that phase, maybe it be right before you made the move um, or maybe directly right after you made the move, stepping into it. What's something that you wish you would have maybe not done or done differently without having that mentor there immediately, you know, but picking them up up full time and stuff. Is there anything that comes to mind for that? Yeah, for sure. I think I didn't understand the power of having your own authority and your own brand. Yeah. And so I was really grinding. I, mean, I was incredibly disciplined, but I was reaching out to, in the morning, I would have an hour and I would just reach out for copywriting jobs for an hour. And then I would work on my current clients. And then for an hour during lunch, I would work on getting new jobs. And then I would work on new cl- current clients. And then at night I would do another session because I always wanted to be first mover. So whenever a really good opportunity came up, I wanted to be one of the first people. And then I would play that game until I got a really big contract and then I would kind of chill out. So I was really yeah. disciplined and I had a, you know, a very systematic approach for getting high level copywriting clients, but I could have charged a lot more if I would have had a personal brand and not been a commodity. So yeah. I, you know, I, I should have had a personal website. You know, I should have had, I should have branded it rather than Jonathan Kendall, copywriter person. I should have said, you know, copyexpress.net or what, you know, anything just branded it a little bit outside of myself. And all of a sudden it's a company. And even if it's just you, um, it has this clout like you're doing, like, you know, have a podcast, have a YouTube channel, you know, be present on Instagram, become a, an authority in the space. And even if people don't find you top of funnel, let's say they don't find you, but they find you through other, some other means, they're going to check you out. And if they check you out and you're checking off the trust objection boxes, they're like, is this person legit? Yes. You know, do they have, do they seem uh, competent? Yes. Do they have a couple of testimonials? Yes. You know, so don't think about it in terms of just lead gen. Think about it in terms of like the final answer to the final objection to close a deal. And a deal could be, you know, your first side hustle gig, or it could be you know, a $10 million B2B contract, you know, depending on who's listening to this, you know, you're going to have different contexts. Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking on that, yeah, we do have some listeners. We have listeners from, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you know, pay attention to these little things because something that I've noticed you did with your personal brand, um, I find hilarious, but it works in, in a hilarious in a great way, you know, is you picked an outfit, you stuck to the outfit and you made it a part of your brand. Um, how, how big of an impact did that make for you? Yeah. So, I mean, I still, I still have the red hat. So, you know, depending on whether it's in person or not, you know, I have little tokens here. I, the main thing is I'm just really bad at fashion and I'm also real (laughs) strict about what I pay attention to. So I'm like militant about what I put in my brain and what I allow my brain to spend glycogen on. And the more you can decide like, Hey, listen, this is the best case scenario. These are the, you talked about habits. Like this is what I should be doing. Then you got to just, you know, David Goggins, like turn off your emotions and just do the thing. And yes. then now you have clarity on the creative because business five years ago is not what it is now. I mean, the number of AI softwares that we're implementing into our agency right now is wild. And if people do not keep up with us, we're going to destroy the world. And I know it because I got one copywriter that can have 20 clients now. You know, I got one video editor that can have 10 clients. So we're lowering prices and increasing efficiency and making the, the, the product better, which is good for the world, right? It's like the world gets a better product for a cheaper price. But my point here is that that isn't easy. Keeping up with all of what's happening is not easy. Making sure that we are um, on the cutting edge, staying, staying uh, creative, you know, knowing what software is to use, that's not easy. And uh, that's where you should be spending your brain power, not on like, you know, what t-shirt am I going to wear because it matches my jeans. It's like, no offense, like unless you are in the fashion space, 
Like, you know, if you're in the fashion, in, yeah. yeah, an artist, exactly. When, when your brand, like the visuals of your brand matter, fair enough, that's fine. But if you're not in that visual space, like a lot of it is just ego and insecurity, to be frank. So, you know, it's like, I choose something that is clean. Like I use the brand that Tim Ferriss recommends because it's, it's kind of feels stretchy. You know, I feel like I'm wearing like uh, pajamas, but it looks clean. Like I'm very on purpose about everything I do. So it, it simplifies my life, but most importantly, it allows room for my brain to, to do the more difficult tasks, which I have to do as an owner of a company. Yeah, no. And that makes sense because as an entrepreneur, you want to a lot of deals I've noticed, especially it's, it's result driven. And as an entrepreneur, a lot of us, especially a new entrepreneur, you might feel that you need the car to look, close the deal. You might need the watch and the suits always to close the deal or to be flashy. And realistically, after sitting down with millionaires and different billionaires and stuff like that, man, they most laid back jeans and a t-shirt type. It's, it's about getting the work done and getting it done efficiently and what could be done here and what could be done, you know, efficiently on the, the software side and all that really, it has nothing to do with your appearance. And once you're able to get over that hump of knowing that that'll boost a lot of people's confidence a lot, because once you focus on the process and the work and the efficiency of what you're getting done, um, like you said, you're going to pick up 10 times more clients. Now you're able to spend all the energy that would go into picking an outfit I mean, some people I see taking 30 minutes to change and, and change again. That's 30 minutes. You could have been in emails or you could have been researching something with the team, you know, all those type of things. What are some tips or some strategies you use to help you stay on top of trends, you know, within your business? Yeah. So I, again, it's kind of the militant nature of what I allow in my brain. So if you go like, this is an interesting experiment. So go through your Instagram or your TikTok or YouTube or whatever the social media platform, your podcast, your audible, whatever it is that you, you uh, use to consume information or entertainment and see what the algorithm is feeding you. Yeah. And it's going to tell you a lot about who you are because if you are someone that's passive, reactive, I'm just kind of, you know, going through life and yeah, you know, the algorithm's cheating me. It's like, no, the algorithm is insane. It you, works. if you want to, you can't, yeah, exactly. It works. That's very true. If you, if you're on purpose and you say, listen, I'm only going to subscribe to these 20 channels. Five of them are AI channels. Five of them are leadership channels. Five of them are my mentors who are like hot on social media. Five of them are talking about, you know, what's going on in finance and crypto. Five of them are personal health and five of them are like, you know, solid relationship advice for like, you know, being a good father or a good husband or a good boyfriend or, you know, whatever it is. Like if you, if you're on purpose about it and you've got these 25 and you've, you've filtered, this is who I want to pay attention to. And you put the bell notification on there. All of a sudden, everything that passively comes to you is gold. Yeah. Because the algorithm wants to give you what you want, which what you want is the cutting edge, top shit from the best leaders, the smartest people in the world. That's what it's going to feed you. And if it's feeding you a bunch of garbage, then you're feeding it by your actions, how you're interacting with it. You're saying, yeah, give me more garbage. And so mm -hmm. honestly, I leverage the algorithms to my advantage. Like all I got to do is go to my YouTube homepage and I know because I follow the right people and I'm subscribed to the right channels and I have the bell notifications on correctly that like any, like for example, every software that my company uses, like if they have an update on any of the channels, I see it same day and I watch the same day because I know my competitors are like, oh, there's this new feature. It actually now integrates with this you know, other software. If we connect that, we can be 30% more efficient. We can give those uh, you know, cost, uh, cost benefits to our, our customers. If I'm 30% cheaper, you know, all of a sudden I'm gonna scale. And it's, it's brutal, man. Like, the, like again, back to the fashion, it's like no one, like no offense, no one gives a shit what you're wearing. They care like, can you make me healthier? Can you make yeah. me happier? Can you make more money? You know, can you save me money? Can you save me time? There's only so many things that we pay for. Like everything, I always say that 
every product or service can be filtered into like either a physical product, a service, entertainment, or education. That's really all we pay for. It's one of those four things. And none of those, to be clear, have anything to do with like what this person's wearing. You know, it just doesn't matter. And if you, if, if you are buying that sort of thing, if you're doing that, then you're just not wise yet because older people that are like, you know, read all the great books and are, you know, more, let's not, I, I don't want to say woke in like the political sense, but they're more like self-aware. They're a little yeah. like old people are like this. Old yeah. people couldn't give a shit, man. Like you, they cannot be bothered. You know what I mean? Cause they know who they are. They're solid. They want to be comfortable. And I think that when we're young, we just don't have a lot of firm, like foundation of our values or like who we are. And, you know, so we're a little bit kind of, oh man, like, I hope the tribe likes me. And, you know, we're just a little bit insecure about that kind of stuff. And sometimes you have to acquire the skills first and then get real validation. You know what I mean? Based on your skills, not based on the peacocking. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Um, Speaking on the whole wisdom experience is what creates the wisdom. And so that's, that's a big lesson. I I've been wearing my, I have my brand and my logo and that's love it. Four years. I think it's been four years. I haven't bought I had a podcast in Miami and I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy a flannel and I bought a flannel and I wore it for the podcast. But man, out of the last four years, you could go through all my photos on Instagram and it's the same brand, same t-shirt, same everything, three different colors, uh, red, white, or black, you know, and then the logos. And I put on this flannel. I'm like, man, I don't feel comfortable in this. Like I feel outside. I feel like I'm trying to do too much because, and it took more energy from me because I was focused on now this whole flannel thing rather than trying to just get straight to the point and, you know, just where would I normally wear anyway? So I've done that within my journey and stuff too, but it comes from experiences and the wisdom you pick up over time, people you surround yourself with and everything. I want to dive a little bit deeper into you raised money, you raised capital for the acquisitions of, you know, Pier 1 Import, Radio Shack, stuff like that. Um, what are some financial habits or financial strategies that you had to discover or learn and then make sure you stick to, whether that be when you're pitching investors or just raising the capital in general? What are some key things that you really had to learn on the finance side to be able to raise, you know, over $100 million for those? Yeah, uh, that was a pretty crazy education I got there. It started with MentorBox because we did a, you know, kind of a friends and family round, but friends and family in San Francisco is still really competitive because everyone's friends and family, you know, is a millionaire and is getting pitched 30 times a year, you know? So um, it, it was, it was an evolution. I would say, you know, understanding basically that everything comes down to two things. So uh, your current income statement and then the projections of your future income statement. So everything can be boiled down to like a few numbers, right? So it's like, right. what is, uh, what is your current revenue? You know, what are your current costs of goods sold? That's your gross revenue, uh, gross revenue. Then you have, uh, your costs, operations, marketing, you know, what's your average order value. And then you'll get, okay, this is our net profit, right? So that's what we're at right now. Now you multiply that by the total addressable market divided by the current competitors. Okay. So if I'm in the, uh, coffee, you know, pink coffee mug, glow in the glow in the dark space. No one's going to invest in you, and they shouldn't, because the total addressable market is too too low, right? If I'm in the uh, every com- company in the entire world needs this software upgrade space, then we're talking you know five hundred billion dollar market cap for this space. Even if you're only at hundred thousand dollars, you might get some investors to come in you because they want to be along for the ride, right? right? So it's it's where are you currently at? Like draw a line. It's a graph. It's like draw a line, there's a graph going up. And then it's, hey, if we get this money, I want to see the hockey stick that's going to go up. And the hockey stick is the total adjustable market better be super high. And there better not be a crazy incumbent. Like think of like ClickUp's valuation, right? ClickUp just got a crazy valuation because Trello and Monday got a you know big one and Asana, right? So you got Asana, Trello, ClickUp and uh, Monday.com, right? These are like, project management softwares, there's other competitors. If I, try to, if I try to compete in that space right now, no one's investing in me, no one cares. Yeah. No one cares, right? Because you're like, wait, all four of those already exist. What are you doing? 
but no, 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 it's different because I have this one feature. A lot of people don't realize that like one additional feature on Instagram or one of these big incumbents will destroy your company. Like, yeah. like and they'll add it for free. They have, they have no, no problem adding it for free. They're like, oh, this thing that you built your entire company on, now Google includes it for free. And you're yeah. like, oh, damn. Like, you know, so just understanding the macro, like people get too self-obsessed. This is like um, Donald Miller is a really good book called Building a Story Brand. And like, whether you read it or not, there's a couple of YouTube videos that are like really summarize it. But he basically says, no one cares about you. They right. care about their own problems. You know, they don't care about your company. They don't care about your product. Like everything is a tool, right? And so for, for an investor, what do they want? They want high return. They want low risk. They want uh, cash flow. And then they want to be able to brag about it. There's some emotional aspect of it. Like I was new or, you know, I was, I'm helping change the world because of this new like ocean cleaning technology. You know what I mean? So there is some emotional aspect of it, but really it's how much money am I going to make? What's the downside risk? And when's my cash flow? Meaning like, am I going to exit in 10 years? Is my money held up forever? Or is this a liquid asset? Cause I'm investing in an apartment complex and I'm going to get, you know, a check next month. Like that matters because it, it de-risks everything. So you have to think about it from the perspective of, an, of, of the investor. And you also have to know that you are competing. If you're trying to raise money, you are competing with every other investment they could possibly make in the world. I'm not joking. They're, you're competing with Apple. You're competing with US bond treasuries. You're competing with S&P 500. You're competing with Bitcoin. You're competing with their uncle's restaurant. They're, you know, everything. You're competing with every other place that they could put their money in. So you better have a damn good reason why they should put their money with you. And a lot of people are like, me, 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 me. They have this thing in their head that they're like this great person. And they have this, you know, game, game changing, world beating technology. And then you talk to them and you're like, well, what are your five major, major, major competitors? And they're like, no one's ever done this. And I'm like, you know, one Google away. And I see like four competitors. I'm like, you're just, you're not taking yourself seriously, bro. Like this is... Yeah. Like, you know, I, like it, it, people just kind of live in the fantasy land and what they need to do is they need to bring it down to the reality of like, this is the income statement. This is the real like competitive advantage that I have. And 99 out of a hundred times, a 999 out of a thousand times, you shouldn't raise money. You should bootstrap it. Yep. Yep. And I think bootstrapping is important too, anyway, to investors, because I mean, we've heard it over and over. And if you haven't, I mean, investors would rather take somebody that's every penny all in selling their mortgage, doing everything they can to make this dream work because they're all in rather than somebody that just took an exit of a hundred million. And they're now they're going to go raise capital for another project because they want to, you know, it's just, they don't care because they just got this hundred million. So if it fails, then their investor just lost all that money. Um, Another thing I forgot what, what you uh, said, you, you were uh, spot on on something. I'll come back to it here in a minute. Um, but speaking on all of that and everything, what do you think has been your greatest experience with that whole either mergers and acquisition or raising capital background? What was your greatest experience and your biggest takeaway from all of that? Um, I think the, the biggest takeaway is that if you build the right system in the right market, the scale is as big as the scale is as fast and as easy as the system you build. Mm. Okay. So like, I'll, I'll give you an example with uh, like a current example that, cause you know, raising a hundred million dollars is like, it's a very different thing than most people are going to, you know, have any concept of. So right. let's take it back to like, I have an agency, you know, and okay. I do like social media marketing for you know, dentists in Orlando. Let's just like pick a simple company, you know, cause I love the, the big vision, but like it took me, you know, 15 years of grinding to get to the point that I was even, and a lot of luck, to be honest, to be in that position, you know, like to be, to be in that position. So let's talk about something that's like more grounded and yeah, sure. yep. the, with uh, like right now, like virtual worker now uh, and Sonic solutions has like over a hundred, hundred clients, which at like a, you know, higher ticket agency, that's a lot, right. Because you're, you're, you're handling a lot of people all at once. Uh, and in a lot of different industries, but we purposely don't do any marketing. Okay. Like the reason why is because we're trying to build to 10,000 clients. Right. Gotcha. And right now, in order for us to add more clients, we need 
to recruit human beings. So this is what Gary Vee says. You become, as you grow, you become an HR company. Every company becomes an HR company, right? You're just hiring the right people, training the right people. You know, people quit. I have, I have over 400 employees. Like every single day, someone's sick. Every single day, someone has an emergency. Every single day, you know, someone's being hired or fired or, you know, there's just so much going on all the time um, that you become an HR department. So as we, I can't just say like, oh yeah, we need 30 more logins to click up. Like that's easy for software or a digital product or something like that, where you just, you just share someone a login and it's fine. That's very different than a service or even a physical product that you're shipping to someone. It's like, oh yeah, we, we sold a hundred today. It's like, okay, cool. Um, you know, now I need, I need 10,000 tomorrow. Are you ready? Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, the Walmart does this to companies, by the way. Well, like oh, as soon do. as you reach a little bit of uh, energy, they, they make you fly to Arkansas, go into their, uh, their negotiation chamber. It's like, looks like a hospital. You go in there and they say, oh, okay, cool. I see that you sold, you know, 1000 units last year. We really like it. Okay. So we're going to need 500,000 units in the next two months. And you have to, the price has to be 70% lower than it is right now. Like they yeah. challenge you and you're like, are you really ready for the big time? And, and that I think is most important. It's like, it's good to understand where you want to go, but also you got to be, you got to play these thought experiments out. Like we added like 25 new clients last month because we, we said, okay, let's open the floodgates a little bit. Let's add a bunch of new clients, but now we're kind of shutting it off a little bit because we're like, okay, let's make sure that we're onboarding everyone correctly. We want to make sure that everyone wins. Like, you know, we're thinking long-term, we want these clients to, you know, be around with us for five years. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to push hard, but then recruiting's not quite ready. So I guess my point here is that like, you got to be self-aware about your business and know like where the holes are, because you know, the faster you go, like the one little bump or wave is going to destroy the ship. So yeah. um, you got to, you got to get in the weeds. And if you're not an operator, if you're not, or some people call it an integrator, if you're not like that step-by-step -step person, you got to have someone on your team that is because I've seen so many visionaries peak with like selling and marketing and branding and like big ideas and coaching. And that's fine that you can take that to, you know, even eight figures, but like not nine figures. Right. You know what I mean? Like at some point you got to start, like the operations have got to back up the talk. And yeah. I, I would, I would say that's one thing that I learned is that it's like the sales automations and the systems and like the lawyers and the legal documents and the just everything involved in that is not just like hey wire me a hundred thousand dollars like the micro details of it yeah. is so important because otherwise it's not going to work yep based on that uh that product scenario with walmart some of you might buy, be thinking if you're listening to this like oh if walmart gave me a five hundred thousand dollar product order that's a good thing right it actually might make you go bankrupt because you're paying out of your pocket and they they got a net 90 or a net six month term on it. So they're not paying you for another six months to a year for that $500,000 order. So there, yeah, there's a lot of different things, you know, in the back end that definitely have to be learned on that. end. that's one that, you know, we've learned as well. Um, what keeps you going, you know, every, every morning, what, what do you do, you know, habitually, whether it, you know, it be goal setting or, you know, visionary stuff. What, what keeps you going every single day, especially being in the tech space? It's a lot, you know, mind takes up a lot of energy creative wise. Yeah. So our big vision is actually to, and I know it sounds weird because we're doing an agency on the back end, but our, what we're trying to do is democratize is kind of a fancy word, but basically make free all important ed education. So mm -hmm. I'll walk you through it. So MentorBox, you know, we built 350 courses, like some of the biggest books in the world, like you know, Extreme Ownership, Jocko Willink, um, you know, Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. Like these are like, you know, the top selling books of the last decade. And we had yeah. them, you know, on our platform. And, and it wasn't like Blinkist, like a summary of it. It was them. It was the person, like the author was on the platform. So I got to meet a lot of them and talk to them and, you know, learn about their books at like a really deep level. And I love, I, I think like for me personally, if you fix water or you fix cancer or you fix, uh, you know, the climate or you, you know, insert whatever the thing is homelessness, like whatever the thing is that, that gets you excited. Like for me, I think education is the meta answer to all of them. 
because yeah. the person who's going to fix cancer is, you know, might be in an inner city in Atlanta or doesn't speak English in, you know, Bangladesh or wherever, like that person's there. And we just yeah. need to educate them correctly so that they will eventually figure that out. And I really like the, um, the kind of the democracy, the, the globalization of, and the, you know, the world is becoming flat in terms of like, you know, we have Zoom, we have, you know, YouTube, yeah. we have softwares that they have free trials and, you know what I mean? So you can kind of get a lot, even if you're, you know, in a country that has a, a you know, currency that's, you know, devalued and, you know, all, you can still, if you're, if you're smart enough and you find the right information, you can really, you know, get clients in you know, the UK and, you know, get paid in the pound. And there's ways to kind of arbitrage this on the other side. You know what I mean? It's like, like you can arbitrage if you're an American company, you can arbitrage it. But if you're, you know, living in India, you can also arbitrage it by getting the right client. And so I really like that. Like, I, I believe in a meritocracy. I'm very American, like capitalistic, you know, I'm like the winner should win. And that's actually in aggregate better for everyone because they'll lower prices and, you know, it's good for everyone. So for me, I think education is the core, the core foundation of that. So what we're doing is we're slowly building, you can go to the website now, it's called virtual courses now. So it's like virtual worker now, but courses, and we're building a platform for like the reason we use it internally for like video editors, graphic design, copywriting, project management, virtual assistants, customer support, sales. We even have architecture and design, like a Shopify, e-commerce. We have all these, these stores that a lot of uh, people now, I think it's fine. I like that university is being disrupted by, you know, by my course on Kajabi. Like, I really like that. I think it's great. Obviously, I was part of that with MentorBox. I think it's good for the world. But I think eventually it's going to go to free. And I think it should. And so, especially when you combine like chat GDP with like AI voiceover plus AI video and demoing, like someone's going to make like in one year, they're going to make 10,000 videos with the right programming. That's like, this is, these are the 50 videos you should watch if you want to become a Shopify expert. And they're going to make it in like 10 seconds, literally. Yeah. So once that happens, it's all going free anyways. So what happens when education is free and information is free? People still pay for services. So that's where, that's why I'm building an agency. Some people say like, oh man, like an agency that's kind of like, you know, beginner level stuff. I'm like, no, no, no. Services is not beginner level. Like at scale, more money is, is spent on services than, than products. So for me, I'm like, give away the education on the employee side for training and give away the education on the uh, client side. Because what ends up happening is I say, listen, this is what we do on LinkedIn to get B2B contracts. Just here, here's, here's the course. If you want to do it, go ahead. But you'll see there's 75 micro steps every single day. And if you don't want to do it, we'll do it for you. Yeah. And they're like, love it. Great. Please do it for me. You know, so that's, that's what we're doing. We're kind of building this like crazy lead magnet top of funnel, which is like free courses. And then the, you know, the upsell from the free courses is, Hey, do you want a job? You should work for me. Or, Hey, do you have a business and you don't want to do this yourself? You should hire me. So it's yeah. just kind of like really, really crazy two-sided funnel. But in the meantime, we're going to, we're going to make this badass education literally free, not like $1 a month, not $5 a month, literally free. Yeah. I like that because I'm a big believer on the education system right now is completely fucked up. And that's what our company is about is you said something specific, which is like the success education, the important education and stuff. And that's what we focus on is success education, how to get people something that's going to get them the results. And it's funny that you brought up that uh, example of the um, offering somebody the education for free. I had a, I was back in SMMA too, when uh, Ty released the SMMA program back in like 2016. So I took it up and I did it. And when I was building websites, anytime I would lose uh, to a competitor, I would spend 30 more minutes on the phone. I'd be like, all right, well, if they told me they were going to lose, if they're going with the other company, I was like, all right, cool. Well, let me, before I end this call, let me just give you all the advice and tips I could possibly give you. I gave them the whole rundown for free of exactly what the competitor was going to do for them, how to do it, how they can even go do it on their back office by themselves, everything. And then they're like, well, why are you telling me all this? Like, it's like, 
why you, you just, I could just go do it by myself. I was like, well, that's why I'm telling you, like, if I'm going to lose you as a customer, I might as well, you know, put you in a position to go make a decision to do it yourself or hire a professional. Next thing you know, two weeks later, we get the call back. Like, hey, uh, you know what? We thought we're just going to go with you guys. And it works out perfect every time. So I'm a big believer in free education. And I love uh, Gary V says it too. He said it a lot in a lot of his daily V stuff. But man, 99% of the information he's going to put out, he's going to put, he don't care about putting out information because he knows 95% of the people aren't going to do shit with it anyway. So that's where they learn so much. And that's a habit that we got to get out of as humans and as just entrepreneurs is sometimes you learn too much and you got to learn to take that information and, you know, start applying it to whatever you want to do. So that way, you know, the application is really where the real education comes in. So yeah, it's funny that you touched on that. Um, one thing I want to talk about too is probably to spend the next 10 minutes or so and everything, but growing up. So I want to talk about, you know, Kendall or uh, Jonathan Kendall growing up, you know, how did that how how was that lifestyle? You know, you said you're always ambitious, and I know that's always a big thing with entrepreneurship. I didn't know entrepreneur was a word whenever I was even 17 years old. I just knew I was ambitious and I wanted to do this, 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 and this. Um, how how was that lifestyle growing up that led you into where you're at today? Yeah, I think that sports can be really important, or just yep. any competitive. It could be academics or what you know. The, the thing that you got to latch onto something when you're young, I think, and try to take it to the end, you know, even if it's league champion or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be at like some state or national level, but yep. um, I grew up in uh, <clears throat> Ohio, Canton, Ohio. And it, you know, not a lot of people know about this, but there's kind of a part of the country that's very good at Olympic wrestling. Right. So if you watch the Olympics, you know, like not WWF, like real wrestling and right. Um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Iowa, like Oklahoma, this kind of like standard, like Midwestern area, Nebraska has a lot of like the best wrestlers in the country come from this, this part of the country, just the same way that like tennis is big in California and Florida and, you know, uh, lacrosse is big in New England, you know, each part of the country kind of has its own thing. And uh, for me, it was wrestling. And, you know, we started when we were five years old because it just was you know, part of the culture and it, wrestling is, you know, it's basically, it's a martial art. So it's discipline. You know, you are fighting another human being that's trying to fight you back. Like, you know, there's no, there's no subjectivity to it. There's no like, Oh, you know, did she stick the landing gymnastics? Not to say anything, you know, not to disparage right. gymnastics. It's crazy difficult, but you know, there's, there's a bit of subjectivity to that. Whereas like you either pin the person or you didn't, or you either took them down or you didn't, and they're fighting you. It's like a war. So that humbles you real fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> and you know, it's not like, oh man, I should be the shortstop because the coach didn't, doesn't like me. It's like, no, like this person literally beat you. So I think that like was crazy for my psyche. And like when I was young, it's just so young being at wars, five, six years old. And but because I was ambitious, like, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat this guy, you know, like just keep on fighting, 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 fighting. And did that for a really long time. And then actually I switched. Um, I took that to the extreme. I ended up like the year before I stopped, I was uh, in Colorado Springs at the Olympic training center. So I, I got it to a pretty high level. Um, and then I just like had a, you know, soul uh, existential crisis. I was like, okay, this is not it. Like, I'm not going to do this for my life. I don't want to actually be in the Olympics. So I actually switched over to speech and debate. So huh. you know, with my school, they called it forensic. So, you know, basically like public speaking. And that right. was like, in hindsight, probably the best thing that, you know, I could have ever done. It was total luck, but we had a really good coach and a really good teacher at my high school. And, um, now I'm very comfortable on camera. I'm comfortable, you know, giving talks and speeches. And I'm like literally trained, you know, for four years of high school and how to give a, a, a speech in a, in an eloquent way. And so that was very helpful. Um, but again, it was super competitive. It wasn't like a club. It was like, you know, we're going to tournaments. And so I think there's something to that where it's like, if you can, yeah you know, stay, you know, get that competitive juices when you're young. I think that's like really powerful because at, you can apply that to 
uh, I, listen, I, I think everyone should, you know, think win, win, win. Like I want my Always. clients to win and I want their clients to win. I want my employees to win and I want me to win. I want everyone to win. I want my wife to win. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm trying to be self-aware to like, Hey, let's, let's, I always tell my team, I don't want a slice of the pizza of the pie, like pizza pie. I want to build a pizza factory and then give all the pizza away. Like, that's what I want. You know, like right. let's, the, let's think growth mindset. Let's think win-win. But at the same time, in order to build that pizza factory, there's other pizza companies that are trying to kill you. So it's like, you know, even if you have altruistic ends, like the market is rough, man, you know? And, and so I, I think that that was probably the coolest thing about my childhood. It's just like, the, it was really competitive. Yeah. And it never surprises me. I, I say this a lot in, in, because it's very true to this day, but two, there's two type of backgrounds. Um, and you can maybe throw a third one in there, but two types of backgrounds that never surprise me if you're a successful entrepreneur. And that's if you were an athlete growing up, or if you at somehow ended up in the army or the military or some type of service, because you build the disciplines, you build the, you know, the competitiveness. And now the thing is about it is when you're in that position and you're in a sport, you have this goal in mind and there is a goal. The goal is win the championship or, you know, go to state or go to the Olympics, or there's an end goal, at least in mind that keeps you motivated internally that this is the route to go. And for me, it was basketball. And I'm glad that at the end of the day, I didn't do basketball because I've always had this one thought is I would never want my paycheck to be directly reflected from my physical ability to perform. And whenever I had that realization, I was like, man, it doesn't matter if LeBron's making, you know, a hundred million dollars, you know, contracts, like he has to work. And if he does not physically put in that work, his check is gone. And so, you know, being able to mentally work and work smarter and, and grow an organization to work, then, you know, being able to earn off of that, I forget who says it, but, you know, I'd rather earn 1% from 100 people than 100% of my own efforts, you know, and that's, that's the route to go. But it never surprises me, you know, that success comes from, those type of backgrounds, whether it be athletics or services, or maybe even if you're a musician or something, but if you have something to compete for growing up, then that's definitely, you know, a big leap ahead of people that don't get involved. And if you're, you know, someone that's in your youth and you're listening to this, you know, whether you're watching, listening to it with a parent or just come across it yourself, Find something that's going to guide you, you know, with a vision in the meantime. And you're going to learn a lot of lessons from that, that later on in life that you can apply it to because your vision's not going to come all at once. It'll come in different spurts of your life. And sometimes something in high school, it'll hit you, but you're not even going to apply that one thought till you're like 26 and you're like, dang, that, that I'm going to apply here. And it, it'll happen that way. So, um, while, uh, while we wrap it up and everything, is there some things that the audience should keep an eye out for that, you know, that you're working on right now? Um, where can they find you? Where can they tune in with you and, you know, get more of your story? Yeah. I mean, you can, I, I, I'm on and off on Instagram. Uh, you know, like I said, right now, we're kind of in monk mode, you know, building, uh, for scale and right, yep. like, you know, I'm very, very blessed to have such a powerful team that we're growing even really just based on referrals. So we're not doing any paid media at all. Like the, which it's funny. I just listened to um, an Alex Ramosi uh, YouTube video today. And one of the last things that he talked about was Naval Ravikant, which for sure is the best book of the last two years, in my opinion, the Almanac oh, yeah. Naval Ravikant. And he, he says that you only do uh, sales because you don't know how to do marketing, which makes sense. Meaning that if your marketing is good enough, they'll call, like if you see a billboard for Bye. the cowboy cheeseburger, you don't got to, the, the person at Burger King doesn't have to sell the cowboy cheeseburger. Like they come in hot, you know, they're like, listen, I want the cowboy cheeseburger. I saw your marketing. It's amazing. Right. So if your marketing is good enough, you don't actually have to sell, but he says you only have to market because your product isn't good enough. Meaning that the, vir the virality of the word of mouth would be automatic if the product was good enough. And I've been obsessed with this idea lately of, 
the, the difference between pleasantly surprised and shocking. So I've been, I've told my team that in our staffing agency, we, you know, we have competitors that are like Filipino agencies and, you know, call centers in India and that kind of stuff. Right. And so when someone talks to me or one of my business partners that are like proper digital marketers at a very high level, you know, from the United States, and we're consulted with them on the call. And we're not just saying like giving them a warm body and say, you know, we're like, we're really helping them out. And, and we're picky too, who we bring on. They're yeah. like, wow, this is amazing. And then, you know, we send them an invoice within an hour. We have resumes that were already ready because we have the system to like give them resumes. We give them voice notes. We have video demos of everything. There's automatic emails and texts, you know, so there's a whole experience just to our sales process. And people are like, listen, like, you know, none of your competitors are doing any of these things. So I trust you. Right. So yeah. there's almost the sale. Our sales process is kind of like predictive of how high quality the product is. Yeah. And so then, then once the product is as high quality, they end up, I, what, what's happening right now is I feel I'm just, I'm being a little kind of like, um, uh, uh you know, transparent and honest with the audience, like, you know, of, of where I'm at right now in the business is I feel like our conversion rate's very high and people are like, wow, like this is really cool. But it's kind of like at the pleasantly surprised, like, yeah, great way. Right. I wanted to be like texting their group chat of their friends. I want them to be like sharing it on their social media. Like guys, I don't like, have you heard of this company virtual worker now? Because they are like in, you know, I want it to be shocking. There's right. a really good, there's a really good book called um, contagious by Jonah Berger. And it's like the subtitle is something like the, the science of virality is a professor at the university of Pennsylvania. And he says <clears throat> that actually the most, the, the thing that predicts virality is not likes or shares on social media. It's word of mouth shares. It's like you're yeah. telling your sister or your brother or like, you know, when you see something really cool and you send it to your, your, your mom or your dad or whatever, you're like, you got to look at this. It's really funny. That's how things go viral. It's because they're sharing it with their actual, they're like five trusted people. And yeah. if everyone does that, it just gets real crazy real fast. And so, but the only way to do that is it has to be so good. They can't ignore you. Exactly. So, so, so right now I'm like, <clears throat> I'm trying to tighten everything up and lower prices at the same time. I want people to be like, I know that some people in the agency space are like, you know, pay, like charge what you're worth. And like, I get it. You know, like obviously the ROI for education and certain services are there, but no offense if you're listening to this and that's what you're doing. Like I'm going to be better and cheaper. And eventually that usually creates a monopoly. Yeah. Like this is, this is a very, this is Peter Thiel's idea from um, zero to one. He says, you don't want to actually compete. Yeah. Don't compete. You, if the winner is so much better than second place that it's not a competition. So that's what I'm trying to build. I'm trying to build. So anyways, you're not going to see me. That's a really long tangent to say, you're not going to see me on social media that much right now because I'm, but like, there's a reason why, you know, it's not because I'm like, can't do it. It's not because I don't have 50 video editors. I do. I literally have 50 video editors. I just, it's not important to me right now because we're setting foundations for the future. So I think more important than, you know, following me is like, who are the other people that you should be following? What are the things that you should be doing? And then just hit those hard. I like that. That's actually great advice because hey, I try to point people at you and turn them down. Not just playing monk mode. I like it. I, we call it, you know, going in the dark as an entrepreneur. Sometimes you got to spend a couple years just going in the dark. Um, monk mode. I like that a little bit better. Uh, you know, you get off a little bit and get focused, but also, you know, whenever you are, especially, um, it, reading is a big part of it, but, um, I'm going to take what you just said and apply it to like reading, because if you're somebody that wants to learn digital marketing or real estate or, you know, a doctor, dentist, or whatever it is that you want to do, you got to focus, say, if you're going to read books, there's no reason to read a book about real estate. If you're trying to figure out marketing, or there's no reason to, you know, read a book about marketing if you're trying to figure out real estate. So, you know, be very intentional with where you're going to be putting your time. Um, and you don't really need to be putting your time watching, you know, some of us on social media, you need to put, be putting the time towards the influencers that are going to educate you on whatever you're trying to go out there and pursue. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that it's <clears> funny, <throat> I get asked because of MentorBox, you know, I've read, you know, 500 plus books on business and success and self-development, all this kind of stuff. And it's funny because now, 
I feel like I, you know, have such a solid foundation. Now I read things on like macroeconomics and like trends in the market and, you know, kind of bigger macro stuff. Um, yeah. Just because a lot of it, I've, like, I've read every book on habits. I've, you know, read every book on morning routines. I've read every, you know, so it's like, I get it. You know, there's like, there's, there's certain things that you kind of, it, at this point, you're either doing it or you're not doing it. There's nothing else exactly. to learn. And so, so I would say, you know, if you're asking those kind of questions, just Google, like, or go to Amazon, like top 10, you know, what does Bill Gates say or the top 10 books? Just read those, like just pick something. It's like the fact that you're asking that question means that you're not a reader, which means that the problem is, mm. and by the way, it doesn't have to be reading. It could be, you know, longer lecture tutorials on YouTube. It doesn't, I'm not saying books, I'm saying the right information. And it really at this, at some point, it's like Google the thing that you're having a problem with, find lists of the top 10, whatever, binge watch them, come up with a plan to say, okay, this is what they suggest I do. And then don't watch 10 more implement it because yeah. the new, the new problem is, are you going to do it? Especially when you suck, because you're going to suck in the beginning. So can you get, because it's easy to be like, I wrote it. I read another book. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword here because you're like, well, yes, you need the knowledge, but the real knowledge comes from application of that knowledge, which turns into skill. So you got to real, real fast turn it into a habit and you're just acknowledged that you're going to suck at it. And it's okay because welcome to being a human, like everyone, like if I started playing the piano right now, I'm not going to be embarrassed because I don't know how to play the piano because I've never practiced in my life. It's delusional to think that I would be good at playing the play piano right now. And I would, it would not hurt my ego at all to be terrible at the piano because I've never played, exactly. but somehow, somehow people are embarrassed about something that they've never done before. I think, man, you've never done it. Why would you be good at it? It's fine. Like you're, you're have a beginner's mind. Just crush it. Yep. And that's living in the world of comparison. And that's something that it's, it's an ego thing, but that's something, again, if you get over that hump of that, and that's, that's a silly one to use, but that's the correct one to use, you know, like going to, I don't know how to play the piano, but there's this concept that in all the books we've read and everything, there's a concept if you're listening called habit stacking. And, you know, it's something as simple, I'll apply it to reading. If you're not a reader, I, I hated reading books. I thought reading books was for losers and geeks and nerds. Like, um, and I was an athlete, so I was like, man, I can't be caught reading. And so, but when I got into it, all I did is you got a habit stack, man. Just go open up the smallest book on your favorite topic and just read one page. If you really resonate with it, you're going to read another page and another page. And if you don't put it down and maybe grab another book and read another page, you don't need to read a full book at first, you know, but make sure that at least you start with the smallest thing. Um, I think John Af Asraf says it. He goes, you got to find something so small that you, it's embarrassing if you don't do it. If you, if we all know we should be flossing our teeth every day, but if you just start with flossing one tooth, like it's so small you know, that we can all just floss one tooth. It takes three seconds, boom, boom, done. So, and then start going from there, add another tooth and another tooth. And eventually you'll be flossing your teeth every day. So, um, there's Jonathan a, there's, I think the best version of that, that I've ever heard. This yeah. is, I, I'm not like a religious or spiritual person, but if you know, Jordan Peterson, he kind of uses like yep. spiritual language sometimes. And he said, uh, if you, a lot of people want to find God, but they don't look low enough. Ah, I think it's the same thing. It's like, you want, you know, the metaphor is you know, apply it to whatever you want. It's like the thing that you want, the answer is a lot smaller than you think. It is. It's crazy. It's huge. And, um, man, I'm, I'm gonna add something else to this conversation then. Cause whenever you're looking, cause a lot of people, they you're around your environment, you have a specific environment you're in. And what's crazy is when you're looking for a, uh, an answer or a something, the thing is, is the answer is so close next to you, but your intention isn't there. So if your intention was to find an answer, um, for example, if I was going to uh, say I wanted to get into real estate, what's crazy is we all know somebody in our circle, it could be a family or a friend, eventually there's a, you know, a what is it, sixth degree of separation or first degree of separation from somebody in your circle that probably invest into real estate that you can easily go have a conversation with and say, hey, I would love to you know, know about real estate investing. Again, just Google the shit, you'll figure it out. But a lot of people were surrounded by the answer already 
we just, our intention isn't there. So if our intention was more there on whatever answer it is, then you'll find an answer right immediately. If you want to move to a new city, um, I got an offer like you did um, when I was in SMMA back in 2016. And um, I was living here in Arizona and I was looking for some investors. So I was like, you know what? Let me message some influencers that I look up to in the marketing space. And I started DMing them like, hey, these are literally just a DM away. And I was just DMing like, hey, I'm in the SMMA. This is what I'm doing. Um, but I want to expand. I want to grow. I just, I, I don't got the money to, but I got all the knowledge and the work ethic to make it happen. And sure enough, the call was like, hey, you, you know, I'll invest into you, but you got to be in Miami. Perfect. Be there in two weeks, you know, hung up the phone, started looking for Airbnbs for, for the first couple months. And sure enough, two weeks later, I was living in Miami, you know, spent that build scaled and got rid of that company um, out in Miami. But it's all from just being intentional. And we're already surrounded by the answer. We just got to, you know, actually implement what we want to do. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, it was a great conversation. I know we could keep on going and everything. Um, you're out in Egypt, so that sounds amazing out there. You know, I'm going to let you get on with your night. Have a great rest of your night and everything. And I appreciate you hopping onto the show and, you know, sharing some value with, you know, if whether you're a startup, you know, entrepreneur or you're somebody that's already making seven, eight, nine figures, there's definitely some information that I got from John that we can apply to our businesses. So, you know, stay tuned, listen, and, you know, take some notes and excited to see you guys on the next episode.